So if, <laughs> just like verbally stop me. Uh, if there's anything that's at all unclear, um, I really do want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so it's totally fine if something doesn't make sense. Um, I can go back and talk about it again. And I want to say thank you again for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I was also in my high school's environmental club. So um, there is so much that you could do um, at everyone in all the different stages of your careers that you are in. Um, and I hope that you enjoy. So today we're going to talk about um, sewage pollution in particular. So those kind of microbes, the microbes we just don't necessarily talk about as much. Um, because I try to predict sewage pollution yeah. using models and experiments to protect the Hudson River. And there's my email down there at the bottom. Um, so like I was saying before, by all means, just feel free to email me if you are curious a little bit more about this topic, if you need advice, anything like that. So the system that I work on is the Hudson River Estuary. And so for those of you who have been in New York, you may not even be thinking outside of this uh, small area where we think of like Manhattan and our Brooklyn and Queens area. Um, so I look all throughout the Hudson River estuary and it actually extends um, up 150 miles um, that's still tidal. So it's really, really high up, well past the edge of this map that is still actually influenced by the Atlantic Ocean coming in, um, basically raising that sea level, uh, river level a bit and then coming back down. So to orient ourselves, like I said, we've got the Atlantic Ocean down here, we have Long Island down here and the island of Manhattan. And so I focus on the Hudson River estuary, mostly the lower part. So I actually look, mostly stay below Bear Mountain Bridge here. And so as you may know, the Hudson River has a pretty well-known history of environmental degradation. Uh, people talk about the Hudson River being a pretty dirty place. Um, it has gotten significantly better, I do want to say. Um, but there are still consistent problems with sewage contamination. But the frequency and the intensity of that contamination varies a lot from place to place. So if I took a sample outside of Manhattan versus a sample up here by the Tappan Zee Bridge, it would vary a lot whether or not there were a lot of sewage microbes or there were a couple of them. So like I was saying, there's pretty strong improvement in recent years. So this is just a, an image here from the New York uh, Harbor Water Quality Report. And so we're extending back into the 70s and then going up to 2012. So it's a bit of a dated map. It's the last time that they put, published all of this information together. So here we're looking at bacterial cell counts on the y-axis and then our years along the x-axis. So basically we're seeing that there are pretty high levels of these fecal coliform bacteria, so our fecal bacteria. Um, and that they're going down over time. So we're seeing that around like the 70s, they're starting to go down. And that should make some sense because that's around, around when the Clean Water Act was enacted. So 1972, the Clean Water Act was enacted and we started seeing improvements, but it did take about 10 to 20 years for it to reach acceptable levels. A lot of that was because of infrastructure development. Um, so you really start seeing the decrease in like the 80s around here. And so then we see over time that we actually got below this bathing standard. So that basically is, Bathing is if you're swimming, because people are not actually bathing in the Hudson nowadays, I hope. Um, but if you're swimming in the Hudson, we want to make sure that it's a low enough concentration of bacteria. And we can think of it like if you take a glass of water, you want to make sure there's a certain number of cells in that glass of water. So if I swallowed that glass of water and it was from the Hudson, or if I was swimming and happened to swallow it, I want to make sure there's not enough bacteria that I would get sick, right? So we want only a few per mouthful. And so in the last 20 years, we've seen improvement in the Hudson River water quality, but overall, it's mostly been localized improvement. We see it's kind of hanging out around this relatively okay area. Still, we have problems with irregular high contamination. So even though it looks like it's good and it's falling underneath these, these standards here, so it's also for enterococci, which we will get to very so shortly, um, it's still falling below those standards, but we have instances of contamination. So what is enterococci? Um, so enterococci are a cocci group of bacteria. Um, and this is just an image of what we might see them if we were looking under, um, I think this is electron microscope here. I don't usually see them like that. I usually see them like this on plates. And basically, if we see enterococcus, there's probably poop. So enterococci are used in water quality assessment, particularly in brackish waters. So you probably have heard of E. coli. And so the EPA uses E. coli for fresh water. So if it's a purely fresh stream, then we're going to be using E. coli to tell us whether or not there's poop. Um, but in salt waters, we're going to use enterococci. And it's used because it's commonly found in warm-blooded animals like us. So it's found in our digestive tract. So when it comes out, uh, when poop comes out, there's enterococci with it. It's very uncommon to find enterococci in uncontaminated water. So we're pretty sure that when we see it, 
there's probably poop, which is why it's called a fecal indicator. It indicates that this water probably has feces in it. And why we um, want to use them is because we can see an epidemiological correlation. So it's not just that there's probably poop. It's mean, it means that when we see enterococci, we actually see people get sick. So the plots that are here, just to make sure we orient ourselves first. So along the x-axis where my cursor is going here, we see that um, the enterococci concentration is increasing as we go to the right. And we're seeing on the y-axis that that's the number of gastrointestinal illnesses, like illness rate basically for a thousand swimmers. So as you go higher on the y-axis, people are getting more sick. And as you go higher on the x-axis, we're seeing more enterococci. So we can think of this as like our x-axis is the smoke, are people being sick as the fire. So like the whole where there's smoke, there's fire. That's what we're thinking. Um, that is a great question. So I just saw Kamal's question pop up here. So enterococci is an indicator we use particularly for human poop, but we also see it in, in other animal poop. So um, we've actually had to do deal with that before where sometimes people will be like, well, the water's contaminated here, but I think it's because of the geese. And then we've had to go through and do like some really serious testing. A lot of times that's when I would bring in antibiotic resistant bacteria because geese are not pooping out antibiotic resistant bacteria. And it tends to be that in the Hudson we see the ARBs, those antibiotic resistant bacteria at the same time as the enterococci. So we're pretty sure that most of it's coming from humans that we're seeing in the Hudson, um, but you can use it for other animals as well. And actually there's a really weird pilot study that I had to do where I did have to use poop from a lot of different animals um, along the Hudson River to see what comes out to make sure that we understood the background information we were getting. So great question. All right, um, and so with our epidemiological correlation, essentially what I was just saying, that even though there's kind of this noisy trend and what I mean by noisy is that, you know, these dots kind of are like up and down and up and down, they don't follow a perfect line. Despite that noise, there's a pretty clear trend that it's like, people get more sick when there's more enterococci in the water. Um, and then the EPA set a threshold of enterococci. So they basically just made this vertical line on this axis here along the concentration of enterococci. And they said, it has to be below this because when we're below this, we have an acceptable number of people who are getting sick. We can't have it be perfect, but we're gonna say, this is the number. If you have more than that, people cannot be swimming. And the reason why people are getting sick is because those enterococci correlate with the bacteria that actually make people sick. And I know that sounds kind of, um, it sounds like we've got too many steps here, but basically enterococci are super easy to grow in the lab. Um, it's really hard to kill them. So it's easy for us to measure them, count them, but then they're what's indicating things like salmonella, shigella, other things that actually make people sick. So people tend to not get sick because of enterococci, but the things that come with it make people sick. It's just easier for us to measure these guys. And then this here is just to talk a little bit more about the Hudson River um, enterococci. So like I was saying, it has gotten a lot better over time, but here is now um, some information from a study with a collaborator. So this is looking at a couple different sites throughout the lower Hudson River. So here we have um, Manhattan again to orient ourselves, Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx. And then this is a bit further up north. Um, so actually the office where Kyle and I worked is actually somewhere around here. Um, and so my field site tends to be this spot there. But overall, what we're seeing here, we have our field sites plotted along the x-axis and this is our concentration again. Effectively, that's just like, again, as we're going up higher along this y-axis, we have more of those bacteria. And so this red line here represents where it's an acceptable concentration for the EPA, that metric that I just showed you. So under this value, fewer people are getting sick. What we can see is that all of those sites are actually exceeding that on average. And we have this really high variability. So those error bars there are saying that Sometimes when we go out to measure, we're getting extremely high concentrations. And a lot of times we're also going out to measure and getting really low concentrations. So sometimes it's super safe to swim in the Hudson. Other times it's very unsafe to swim in the Hudson. And so the takeaway really is that like sewage pollution is a problem, the variability in it, and also the amount of sewage pollution. We still can't really constrain when it happens based off of these data alone. So that high variability makes it really hard for us to predict when people should or shouldn't be swimming in the Hudson or boating. I know not everyone wants to go swimming in the Hudson. Um, I understand. Um, so modeling, uh, so this is like one example of some models that were done before I got to, um, to Columbia. There was basically a predictive model to try and say, okay, where would this pollution end up? So if we have a discharge of pollution um, from say the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where is that pollution going to end up? 
Um, and the model didn't actually predict where the pollution was going. And that just basically went to show that like a hydrodynamic model wasn't enough. So tracking where the water moves didn't actually show us where the pollution was going to be later. So where people needed to be careful. So bacteria probably are having these different transportation, so like different transport throughout the water body and also persistence. So some of them might live longer, some of them might die faster. So one of the ways that we could address this high variability is maybe we could sample more, right? So if we saw those, those huge error bars, so sometimes we went out and it was high, sometimes it was low, we could just go out more often, right? But that requires uh, boats. Oh yes, great question. So I just see this pop up. Also, if, my, if I don't hear your question or see it on the screen, please definitely just interrupt me. Um, so the kind of test that we do for these bacteria, so we're growing them. Um, and I do have a slide on the exact experiment later, but essentially I'm taking the water and I'm filtering it and I'm putting that filter on top of a really nutrient rich media. And so the bacteria just love being on that. If you put them at the right temperature, then it selects really well for a particular group. And then you can count those. And I'll show you some, um, some photos of it soon. So the problem then with like thinking about more frequent sampling. So this is an image, this is actually from when I was doing a coral reef project in uh, Florida. Um, so if we have a boat, we have to have boat time. I actually am not licensed to drive a boat, so I need a boat captain. Um, all of those things just cost, cost a little bit more. It's a little bit more logistically complicated. Um, we also have to go down to the water. Um, we have to collect our samples. So that's like whatever supplies, it's whatever time. So this is me um, here with my lab mate, Carol, wonderful lab mate. And so we, we go out together, but you know, it takes you know, 30 minutes round trip to make sure we get everything, do all the measurements. And then also it's very time consuming. So this is me looking very patiently at my samples as they slowly filter. So what I was just saying about the filtration, so I put the water in the top of this filter flask here, and then it's slowly pulled through via vacuum and that water is being pulled through a filter. So all the bacteria are being caught on that filter that's in between basically where that little blue clamp is. So this is totally an option, but we could also prioritize predictive modeling instead because maybe that would give us a better sense of what's actually going on. Um, yes, <laughs> Kyle's definitely right. All of aquatic microbiology is just basically filtering. Um, so you get a ton of water, filter it, hope that bacteria are there. Um, and so like, while that works many times, it's like, well, could we do it another way where we don't have to go out as much and where maybe the bacteria don't grow or maybe the filter rips or like all of these little things that could really mess up an experiment. So the challenge that I've been trying to address is can we predict the concentration of the indicator bacteria? So our enterococci um, and the potential pathogens in the absence of intensive sampling. Like, can we do this and can we keep people safe without the ability to go out all of the time? And one thing I wanted to bring up here because I thought this would be a potentially um, really good point of conversation for later. So there's this quote, um, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so this people talk a lot about with climate models as well. So all models, and I think especially with like environmental models, all of these models are going to be wrong because we have to make some assumptions. Um, we can bound those assumptions, of course, and we can try to make sure that our model is as robust as possible, but we know that they're not gonna be perfectly right. But it's trying to make sure that they're somewhat useful. And so the way that I'm trying to make my models useful, so this is just like the DCDT is the concentration, change in concentration over time. It's just basically saying that I'm using partial differential equations. And the way that I'm trying to make sure that my model, even though it's wrong, I know it's wrong, even I wanna make sure that it's somewhat useful. I'm using experiments, I'm using field work. And then this last one here is basically saying that I'm doing a lot of sensitivity tests on the model to see how robust are the conclusions that I'm getting from it. So we're gonna dive in a little bit into this particular part of the project. So something we need to understand first is microbial particle association. So microbes can attach to particles. Um, and here's just an image. Um, so this is a combined sewer overflow in Manhattan. So essentially what's happening in Manhattan and also in Albany, um, all the water that comes through our sinks, um, through our toilets and all of that stuff goes into the same, um, same pipes. And that same water, like the storm water is also going through that. In general, that's a good thing because so say if we didn't have a storm, all of that water, all of the water running off of the streets and everything will be diverted to the wastewater treatment plants and all of it will be treated before it's discharged into the river. However, when it rains, that system gets overwhelmed. And so you can kind of think of it like there's a little dam and when it rains, that water just goes over the dam. So that means all of your water from your shower, your sink, your toilet is mixing with the storm water and going straight into the Hudson River 
whenever you have this combined sewer overflow. And that happens when there's a quarter of an inch of rain or more in Manhattan. So it is not a lot of rain for there to be poop coming straight into the river. So like just PSA, if it rains, maybe take like three to four days before you go swimming in the Hudson. That seems to be about the amount of time that it takes for the bacteria to die away, just like heads up. That is a great question. Um, the question is, is this true in every city or is this a uniquely New York situation? So New York City and Albany both have it. Um, and there are, I can't remember the number of municipalities across the US, but there are many um, across the US that have this same system. The combined, um, sorry, it's a separated sewer system is what's the newest model. Um, and there are more cities that have that, but it's definitely more expensive where basically all the stormwater goes separately. And so then if the stormwater gets overwhelmed, only that would go into the river um, as opposed to like stormwater plus poop and like toiletries and all of those things. So also like when you're um, in Manhattan or in Brooklyn um, or Queens, think about potentially not showering as long when it's raining because we know all of that water is going straight in, exactly straight into the river. So shorter showers, I choose not to do my laundry during rainstorms just in case. Um, Cause we also have like microplastics from our clothing. So just like little things that we can do that can reduce the impact on the river itself. So when we look at a combined sewer overflow we can kind of see in this water here that this water like the in the foreground it looks a lot clearer whereas right where that um, outfall is coming it's a pretty turbid plume. So turbid meaning there's lots of particles in there. And if I sample right in the middle of that high um, turbidity high particle laden plume then we have a lot of fecal indicator bacteria, a lot of huds, or a lot of enterococci. And so all of these different bacterial groups um, can be particle associated or free living. And this is all bacteria. So all microbes can be either attached to particles or free living. And the amount that they're attached to particles varies a lot among the groups. And so I just put up here um, a couple of different groups that I sampled in particular, uh, just so you can see like some actual data. So we see there's a high, again, high variability. You see these error bars here. This is saying that a lot of the things that I'm measuring, like there's just sometimes there's very little particle association and sometimes there's a lot. Um, and so we're seeing overall though that there's like this non-negligible fraction. And something to know is that our fecal bacteria are more particle associated than our free living bacteria, like the ones that are in the background. Or sorry, so the, the background bacteria are less particle associated than the fecal bacteria. So that's something we need to think about when we think about pollution, right? Because if pollution, we're thinking about our sewage drive bacteria, if they're mostly attached to particles, that probably means something for how they're transported, how long they live, all of those things. So why would they want to be particle associated? Particles are generally considered to be a more favorable environment for bacteria. And so there's this theoretical ecology principle called island biogeography. And essentially that like, if you're on an island, like life is good, you've got the things that you need, it's a slightly more stable environment. So you can have greater biodiversity, greater um, uh, bio microbiological density. So you basically can have like more of these bacteria, different types of bacteria, all living on the same little particle. Um, island biogeography, I would definitely recommend you look it up because this is a very particular application of it. Um, but anyway, to say all this to say the particle association overall, if a bacteria is attached to it, potentially then, it's getting shaded. So um, we can think about fecal bacteria, if they live inside of our gut, they probably don't want to be exposed to sunlight, right? They live where the sun does not shine very much so. And we can think about UV um, disinfection that we're using. So if you've been using UV on your mail um, throughout the pandemic, like you know that UV is good for, for killing bacteria, um, we can think about it like that. So this bacteria down at the bottom of this particle would then be shaded also they potentially are sinking. And if they're sinking, they're getting further down in the water column. So they're getting exposed to less sunlight because water or light as you go down through the water is going to decrease. And also they potentially are getting like a good snack if they're living on a particle. There's a lot of nutrients potentially on whatever they're sitting attached to. And particles, um, just to clarify, can be anything. I'm not doing a um, compositional analysis right now. I'm mostly doing a size specific analysis. So it's like, if it's above when I try to filter it through something, again, our filters are pushing water through something. If it passes through, it's not particle attached. If it stays above, it's attached to a particle. Particles, for me, I've seen shreds of toilet paper, um, little bits of leaves, dirt, grass, anything like that. So particles can be anything. Um, so then can definitely affect the ecology of these bacteria. So 
when I think about my system, I try to think about it in like, what are the big dynamics? And I thought it'd be helpful for us to look at this together. So we can think of this as just like a really, like a cut section of the Hudson River. It's like a really simplified version of it. So we have a little source where we're going to have pollution come out. So we're gonna have a discharge. And we're gonna say that our water is flowing this direction just for the sake of this info infographic here. So if our discharge is coming in, we're getting particle associated, those are the rimmed in yellow, and then free living, just the little green dots by themselves, we're getting both of those bacteria coming in together. So what happens over time though? We know that these bacteria, when they're subjected to sunlight, again, where the sun does not shine in our intestines, right? They're gonna be dying a lot faster because of sunlight. Also, those that are attached to particles are going to be sinking. And then we know there's probably some sort of dark period loss. And we can say that because inside of our gut, again, it's a very stable environment, um, even though maybe sometimes it doesn't feel like it. It's very warm, it's very dark, ideal place for a lot of these bacteria to grow, um, for a lot of the fecal bacteria to grow. So then if they're in a kind of cool, salty, oops, sorry, that is my mom's phone. I hope that wasn't important. Um, <laughs> So uh, the dark period loss um, then is basically like what we're expecting to have happen in the background because they're not in an ideal environment. They're going to be dying at some, some rate. So those are like the general things you need to think about when we're thinking of the Hudson River system. So this gets us to like the questions that I've been trying to address, which is how does particle association impact the transport and persistence of those bacteria, those sewage drive bacteria, and then to answer that, we actually need to understand how does it affect those major loss rates? Those loss rates I just showed you, the light loss, the background loss, the sinking, how does it affect that? So this is where I'm dividing it into a model and then the experiments. So the experiments are gonna be informing the model. So now we get into the fun stuff, like how do we actually sample this? How do we actually find out how many poop bacteria are in, in a water sample? So first we go out, we collect the water. This is out by um, the Piermont Pier. So it's um, a little bit south of the Tappan Zee Bridge. So I go out, I collect a bunch of water. We do um, surface bucket casts, which basically means I throw a bucket into the water and then I haul it back up. That's all that means. If you see that in the scientific literature, a surface bucket cast is literally that. Then I take the water, I put it inside of a cooler and I make sure that it's dark. Um, so that I don't have any sort of um, perturbation from, like I don't have anything dying from sunlight. Um, I'm not having anything dying from my like, temperature exposure. I'm trying to make sure that the bacteria just stay the whole time until I get them to the lab, which usually takes about 20 minutes. And then I pour water from this bucket. I measured out in my cylinder first, and then I pour it into the top of this. So this here um, is a particle separator. And so like Kyle was saying or messaged earlier, filtering is all that we do. So here I have attached a little hand vacuum pump and you can see it's sealed on this edge here. So I'm basically creating a little bit of negative pressure so I can pull the water through a filter that is located in the middle of this. So in that like the hourglass, basically that middle part of the hourglass, there's a filter there. And that filter is stopping the particle associated bacteria. So on the top, we'd have the particle fraction, the bottom, we'd have the free living fraction. So the stuff from the top is all the particles. So then that's actually put onto these small 50 mil tubes and it's attached to this shaker plate and I literally shake them apart. So it's agitation. You're physically separating the microbes from the particles. Because if I try to run the rest of the experiment with them, sometimes particles can have multiple microbes on them, which would make sense. It's ideal to be on a particle. And then I wouldn't be able to count them. And then I take the microbes that have been shaken off the particles, as well as the microbes that have just come through in this free living fraction, and I filter them. So again, I'm pouring them in the top of this filter flask. That's my little filter on the flat or on the stand itself. And then I am pulling air, um, basically pulling water through the filter again with negative pressure. Then I take those little filters and I put them on little petri dishes. So that's where um, all of the, the chemical chemistry part comes into it. So I basically am mixing a particular media that is ideal for Enterococcus. That's what these plates are here. Um, and so it's basically the food that they would wanna eat. It's the chemicals that they would be most happiest in. And then I put them um, at 40 degrees Celsius. So again, in like the really ideal environment for them. And then afterwards, I get a plate that looks like this. Um, this is just a plate of Vibrio. So a different bacteria group, but it's the easier one to see. So you can see all these little like colonies here. So those are like little dots. Um, each individual cell 
after you let it grow up over time, will form one of those colonies. So then I can say, okay, I had X number of cells on this filter. And then you, you basically write down what is the amount of water that I passed through. So if I had gone, if I had done like 10 mils of water to get this number, I would say, okay, I have, I don't know, 40 cells, it's probably like 60, 60 cells per 10 mils. And that would be my concentration. So the experiments that I, oh yeah, great question. So what do I grow them on? So there's very specific, they're called auger. Um, so it's very specific bases. Um, so let's see, so this one here, this is a TCBS auger. So um, it's like thiosulfate, so there's all sorts of different chemicals in there to basically, so it's not just the chemicals that you want them to, to consume. So it's kind of like, if you think of what is the most ideal food for you to like, to be your best self, that's what we're trying to do for these microbes. We're trying to give them absolutely the best stuff that they would want. Um, but then we also have a few things that are within the plate um, to try and make sure we can identify them and distinguish them. So for the enterococci cells, which you'll see in a little bit, a few later slides, they actually have a blue halo around them. Um, and so that's something that's done like within the chemical, um, within like the mixing of the chemicals for the plates. Um, so they're like cleaving a certain bond that basically makes it blue, makes a blue halo around them. So we do actually care about the color um, that comes up afterwards. So here we have like these yellow versus green um, colonies here at Vibrio, it's again, a chemical reaction. Um, but overall, we're giving them like the ideal food for them to live on and then putting them at the right temperature. Does that, does that answer your question? All right, well, so the next thing, um, oh, awesome. Um, so I just wanted to like show a little bit of like the temperature dependent experiment. So the different experiments that I set out before of like, I have to measure this rate, that rate. Here's as an example of the temperature dependent experiments. So I had little bottles of, um, of water. So they were, I have five, 18 and 28 degrees Celsius. And so these are the little bottles of water that I had them in. So those actually hold 250 mils of water. Um, and then they each got put in, into the dark um, into an incubator set at that temperature. And so those were done for two days. And so I measured the initial concentration of enterococci. So I passed it through the filter. I figured out how many cells per volume, because remember we wanna know how many cells per mouthful. That's what's really important when we think about protecting human health. Um, and then I measured it at 24 hours and 48 hours to see how they decayed over time. And then I also did light induced experiments. So remember we think that UV light is gonna be most important for this. So I had to put them in a temperature controlled situation. So this is a water bath here that was outside, um, maintaining the temperature at 18 degrees Celsius to try and make it match the temperature dependent treatment here so that I could use that to back out what is the light loss only. Um, and because this is something that we expected to be the most significant loss, um, I did the time points, the time points were much shorter. So only zero, one and two hours. And then I also measured the light um, via light core meter. So I basically just had a sensor out there measuring how much light because I did this on many different days. So I wanted to make sure I could compare um, each one of those samples. And I wanted to just have like a real talk moment because um, science is a struggle at times um, because you're really trying to make sure that you do it correctly. Um, and so I wanted to just be very real about like, this is what happens also. So light dependence, or light induced loss, however you want to call it, was such a hard uh, time for me. This took me like a year, two years, I think, to actually get it to work perfectly. Um, so yeah, I've initially started out with my setup that I just showed you over there. So I have some of the samples that are inside bags. I had some of them inside little mesh screens to reduce the light by 50% to see what's the difference between zero exposure, 50% exposure, and full exposure to sunlight. Um, I had problems keeping the water bath at the right temperature. So I actually had to fill the water bath with ice cubes and ice packs beforehand. This is a chiller that we found in the building. Um, and so I had to like clean it to make it work. And it did actually end up working in the end, but it took a lot of effort to make it work. And then I also was collecting samples mostly from Piermont Pier, um, but they weren't growing any enterococci or they weren't enough. We did. Yes, I, so Kyle's saying that we used to eat lunch on that table and we definitely did. And every now and then I would commandeer it for an experiment. Um, so the good thing about working on a big science campus is you can just like put something like this outside and everyone's like, oh sure, someone's doing something. Um, so when I'm doing these experiments, you need to have a certain amount of enterococci in the beginning and that, because you wanna kill them over time, right? When it sounds bad, but in light exposure, I'm trying to reduce the concentration. So if I had, zero enterococci to start with, I can't kill them in two hours with light. 
I need to have some so that I can actually see how they decay over time. And from the Hudson River, this point at Piermont Pier, I was not getting enough to actually do that, which is a good thing for the river, a frustrating thing for me because I would grow, I would have all these plates and I would do the whole experiment. And then the next day I would come in and nothing grew so many times. It was very frustrating. So then I ended up switching my field site to this place here. So this looks super idyllic. It actually looks like less industrial and you would think it would be like the most clean, pristine place. There's even a little fishing sign next to it, which I feel like is misplaced. Um, but there's also this little sign here that you can see, um, which is a special permitted environmental discharge site. Uh, so there is a lot of poop there and we're not entirely sure where it's coming from, um, but we do know that it's, it's, uh, somewhat, it's coming from the municipality that's right by. So it's human related sewage. I've tested for the antibiotic resistant bacteria. We found them there. We don't know why exactly it's so high, but it always is. And so this is then the difference between those sites. So this is the speedy site that the really pretty pristine site, that's that water there. And then this is the water coming from Piermont Pier. And the darkness of the water does not mean that it's like cleaner or less clean. It just happens to be there's also discharge. Like if there wasn't a discharge point, this darker water here would probably just have, have just as much poop or as little poop as the other water would. So after changing a field site and completely revamping the system, I went, basically I had the same system, but then I added these whirl pack bags instead of these little containers because also the containers leaked, which was great. Um, and then that like contaminated all of my samples and had to start over again. But eventually, after many, many iterations, I got plates where you could actually count them. And so this is the plate that, uh, this is what enter cockeye plates look like. So if you can see, like I was mentioning before, we have those little colonies that are rimmed in blue. Um, so if they were rimmed in blue, I knew that they were um, bona fide enter cockeye and I could count them. And so this plate would have been a particle associated one. So we're seeing so much of this kind of like brown matter around it. Um, so those plates tended to have that kind of uh, undertone to them just because a lot of that stuff was getting passed through the filter as well. So just to give like a quick summary of like, what did we find? Um, attaching to particles um, does seem that it's actually really important. So for light loss, it actually decreased it significantly. So kind of what I was talking about before that it's like probable that there's some sort of shading um, if you're like the part, the enterococcus on the bottom of the particle, but it decreased the light induced loss actually pretty significantly. So about half, um, the free living fraction died much faster. Um, and so, oh, sorry, that shouldn't be meters per day. That should be per day um, only. So minus 16 per day versus minus 33 per day, pretty big difference. Good to be on a particle there. What about dark period loss? So in the dark, they actually grew which was surprising because I put them into these bottles and I was going to measure how fast they died. Uh, and then they didn't. And that was very concerning for generally um, thinking about water quality. I was like, oh, I thought that the salmonella and the enterococci were surely going to die. And they did not. Um, the salmonella actually grew quite a bit, which is something that will come out in another paper. Um, and that one is more concerning. <laughs> but in this case, it was not a huge difference. But we did see that being attached to particles actually contributed to this like 0.3 per day growth as opposed to a minus 0.3 per day loss. So the free living fraction died, particle associated fraction grew. So first two, seems like it's a good, good deal to be on a particle. And then for this last one for sinking, this is another experiment that I did with my advisor. So the free living fraction didn't sink. So that's the zero meters per day. Um, but then the particle associated fraction did sink. So they sank at about a meter per day. So overall, we can say that particle association increased enterococci survival. And we say that because light didn't bother them as much if you're attached to a particle. Also in the background, they grew instead of died and they sink, so they get further away from the sunlight. So overall, it looks like it's pretty good. But what does this even mean for environmental persistence? So if we think about those loss rates, that's, we've just now quantified the loss rates, but that doesn't tell us anything about how that would actually manifest in the water. And so this is when I started thinking about how can I put this into the model, a model that's wrong, but that hope is hopefully useful. So I then took this model, or took these experiments, sorry. I put them inside of a simulated water body. So I have like a very basic water column here where I have some turbulence going on. I have both my particle associated and my free living cells. I'm exposing them to sunlight. The sun is on a, um, a dial cycle. So we have like sun in the morning and it increases until we get to noon and then it decreases again. Um, and then we have an eight hour night cycle. 
And then I wanted to model those two fractions independently. And so this is a novel thing that hadn't been done before to actually see like, what's the difference between these free living bacteria and then the bacteria that are attached to particles? Like, does it actually change anything now that we know the different rates, loss rates, the major rates for them? So this is what my outputs look like. Um, and this, this is blank first, don't worry. Your screen is not, is not messing up. I wanted to just orient ourselves before we actually went into what's going on. So the axes that I have here, so this first one on the y-axis is turbidity or KD. So KD is just a way that we measure turbidity. So I want you to think about that as like how dark the water is. Um, yes, um, okay, so the question that popped up is like, how do you know what equations to use for your models? That's a great question. So um, one of the, so I knew that overall, I wanted to look at the concentration of these bacteria over time. So that's where that like very basic um, DCDT thing. So DCFL, so the concentration of free living bacteria over time. Um, so that part I knew was like, this is my initial thing. This is what I want to know. And so I actually used that, the image that I had in the beginning as part of my um, thought process for what do I need to include in this model? So I, I was constraining it based on like, okay, what are the major loss rates? Because I know that there's going to be um, some sort of input of these bacteria. In many dynamic systems, you think of like a reproducing term, like a reproduction term. In the case of these bacteria, the general assumption is that fecal bacteria just die rapidly once they enter the water body because they um, are so attuned for living inside of a warm, um, like inside the warm gut of, of an, a warm blooded animal. So I didn't have to have like that reproduction term, I thought, um, but I was like, okay, well, there, there are like a couple different ways that they die and there are a couple different ways that they get transported. So that's why I was looking at that sinking term. Um, and so then doing those experiments, I was able to see like, okay, which ones actually have a value and then which ones I actually have to include in the model. So there were a couple of other things that I tested that were like not really that important. So I tried to see if, if bacteria would switch from particles to free living and it's pretty non negligible or it's pretty negligible like any sort of switching dynamics. Um, so basically doing some of those experiments were really helpful um, to figure out what are the things that actually should be in the model and what things can I toss out? So that was a great question, thank you. Um, all right, so get us, getting us back to here. So we had our first axis, which is our turbidity. And then we have our X axis down here, which is our turbulence. And so that's, if we think about like how much wave action we have. And so we're going to kind of orient ourselves a little bit more. So if I'm at the origin here, I'm in a very clear, so my turbidity is really low. I'm also in a very non-turbulent or calm water body. So if I was at this, very, this origin here, I'd be in like a Lake Tahoe setting. You could see the, the rocks beneath you, you could totally stand a paddleboard with a dog. If I was instead going along this axis to something that's like super calm, but that is very dark, very turbid, that'd be like a really calm mud puddle, like this one here. And if instead I went along this axis and so I got to be more turbulent, but it was still really clear, this would be something kind of like Big Sur in California. So that coastal California water, very clear, but there's a lot of wave action, you can see it here. And then if instead I go up to this upper point here, now I'm getting into water that is pretty dark and it's also choppy. So high turbidity and high turbulence. And this is actually a picture of the Hudson River. So when I'm thinking about my system that I'm most concerned about right now, it's in this upper corner, but I wanted to make a model that was applicable to other systems as well. And the last thing is I wanted to just highlight that the measure that I'm using is T90. And that basically means persistence. So the hotter we're getting, so if we're going from this red to pink color, for closer to pink, it's persisting longer. And it's just the amount of time. And so T90, for anyone who's interested in engineering, is basically the time it takes for 90% of it to decay away. So you're basically kind of like draw, you're, you're measuring your concentration over time. And then where you're crossing the 10% line, that's where you drop for T90. But for anyone else, basically it's just like how long they last. So let's look at an example of the free living fraction. So this is looking just at those bacteria that aren't attached to particles. So it's a little complicated, but overall we're seeing that we have like this lower persistence if we're in kind of like this really clear water. Um, regardless, if we're in really clear water, it doesn't matter how turbid we are because the sunlight is going straight through and it's killing all of those bacteria. They're not really moving anywhere. Um, if you get more turbulent, so we're getting more wave action if we go a little bit further off of this bottom axis. So basically you can think of it that the waves are helping to move those cells down a little bit deeper. So if it's a free living, poop bacteria, it's on the surface, um, it's probably gonna die really fast, but if it gets the chance to be moved down a little bit deeper into the water column because of the water, 
it's going to last a little bit longer. So we can think about like lasting a little bit longer if we're going along the x-axis. And then if the water is darker, so if that, that bacteria gets to be moved down a little bit deeper into water that's pretty dark, it's going to last even longer. So that's the general pattern that we're seeing here. And overall, we can say, as we're going in this direction, we have higher persistence of those bacteria in turbid and turbulent water. So the system that I'm working on makes me a little bit concerned, right? Because I know that the bacteria can last longer. But what about this when we think about our particle associated bacteria as well? Because this is only the first one, right? We know that our particle associated bacteria last longer and this is plotted with the same color scale. And so what we see right away is like, there's a lot of pink, right? So the particle associated bacteria are lasting significantly longer than the free living fraction. We see the same general kind of pattern that we're seeing an increase as we go to more turbid, so our darker water, our more wave action dominated water, but we're seeing that transition very fast. So overall, we can say that the particle associated, particle associated enterococci persist a lot longer, up to four days longer in some areas. So basically in some of these conditions, so like if I'm looking at a water body that's like a little bit clearer, so if I'm looking more in my um, mud puddle type situation, we're seeing that like much longer um, persistence but, and I've starred now the area that I'm thinking about, something that I'm really interested in is the fact that both of these fractions persist longer in those turbid and turbulent waters. So Hudson River situation, we really need to think about um, how that is changing the persistence of these bacteria. And then this gets to that last point, because remember we talked about before, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Can we really trust the predictions of this model? Because I've now just, I've taken this data from the Hudson River, right? That's where I was taking the microbes. That's where I was finding them, growing them, all of that stuff, testing them. And then I now just said, okay, you can do it for lakes. You can do it for turbid rivers. You can do it for coastal California. And then this is the type of persistence you get. So the way that I tried to, um, to justify that was to go through sensitivity testing. So here I have kind of divided them into these little categories. So this is, these are the rates that I was using to, that I was manipulating for all of these different runs. And so this T90 variability here is basically just saying like how different is the prediction um, from the model run where I use like all the average values from all the other times that I changed it. So I took each one of these values. So like I took the sinking rate here and I got, when I made those measurements, so we can look up in this corner here at this, this graph here. So basically you can think that I made a measurement of let's say light induced loss and I got a value that was somewhere in the center of this, but I actually had a distribution that was pretty wide. And so I wanted to make sure that the, all of the empirical values that I measured actually still resulted in the same conclusions from the model. So I sampled a thousand times from that distribution randomly, and then ran the model forward to see what would happen. And so I did that manipulating just the light rate, just the temperature rate, just the sinking rate, and then also manipulating all of them together to look at the overall model um, efficacy. So what I got from this is that model predictions were more dependent on temperature. So basically what I'm saying is that here we have greater variability. If I change the temperature rate, we see the model output changes a lot more. So that just says that when we're doing these kind of models, this kind of work in the future, we actually need to think about what's happening in the dark more than what's happening in the light, which is not at all what we thought before, because we think again of like UV killing bacteria, um, particularly fecal bacteria, um, so we didn't necessarily think that that would be the case. And then we also saw overall that estuary showed more variability. And so we see that the estuary um, marks here, they're much higher. And so that one takes a little bit of thinking because we think of our estuaries, there are more turbid and turbulent cases, right? So the water is darker. So there's a lot more motion. And then also the motion can actually contribute a lot to whether those bacteria survive because they're moving to darker water where they don't die as fast. Um, so we're seeing overall that measuring these values in general is really important for all the systems. The lake values stay pretty similar throughout. So we think that this model can apply really well to lakes. Estuaries, the values still stay somewhat similar, um, even though they do show more variability because of the dynamics in those systems. So overall, this is just like a way for us to determine whether or not we think we can trust it. And based on these outputs, it seems like, yes, we can trust it. And overall, something that I wanted to stress is that, so I ran this model forward all of these different times. So this is 4,000 times um, for the different parameter values. Um, and in every single case, I found that the particle associated fraction persisted longer, which was quite striking. So that means that even if I take a, va a value that's at like the lowest end of my um, temperature 
spectrum and I take one at the, the highest end of my light spectrum, I'm getting that the particle associated bacteria lasts longer. So even if I vary everything else, it seems like that is one conclusion that for sure, it matters a lot when we're thinking about management, if bacteria, sewage bacteria in particular are attached to particles. So going back to our previous point, it consistently increases persistence. And so what does that mean for future water quality modeling? So our free living and our particle associated cells again, right? If in sewage pollution models, we neglect particle association, that means that we're probably gonna underestimate sewage pollution persistence, especially in areas that are turbid and turbulent like the Hudson River, which then means that we might be underestimating the risk of waterborne illness to people. So it's really important for us to think about the ecology, the dynamics of these bacteria once they enter a system like the Hudson River. And just to kind of like pull us back again, so this model was wrong, but was it useful? And I'm very biased, right? Of course, I say yes, but like, please also push back. Um, so I think that from this model, we did learn that particle association pretty universally increased sewage bacteria persistence. So it seems like it's pretty important. And also we found that like there's in turbid and turbulent systems, there's probably this longer persistence and a greater difference between those fractions. So in turbid and turbulent systems, we really have to think about management applications related to the, the in-water dynamics of the bacteria. And we also know now that we have to include particle association in these models. We can't just do a fluid dynamic model and say like where the water is going, the, the sewage poop is like sewage pollution is going, because that's not necessarily the case. They're not traveling with the water, they're potentially sinking, um, and they also have all these different dynamics. So what we still need to know is we need to think about how does this match with real world discharges? So this is um, this is a totally uh, made up world that I'm coding them into. What about a real world system? So I want to actually sample in, in an event. Are these bacteria groups, do they have similar persistence patterns to other bacteria groups, especially like the Salmonella Shigella that we are interested in? And then what additional dimensions, um, or what would additional dimensions be able to tell us about the sewage bacteria hotspots? So thinking about like this system is a 1D, 2D situation. I didn't look in three dimensions. If I added the third dimension, would that really change the predictions and would that be able to tell me something new? Um, I'm sorry, I, the chat, I missed the question that just came up. Um, do you mind chatting it one more time since my- I can, I can read closed. it out. So Anastasia asked, oh, thank you. Um, what kind of particles do bacteria prefer? Mm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Kyle. Um, and thank you, Anastasia. So that is a really great question that um, I wish that I had a really good answer to. Um, overall, in other, so I have not measured it myself, but in other studies, we've seen that where there's higher concentrations of organic matter on particles, that's been really helpful. So thinking of something that's like an organic aggregate. So um, maybe something like some plant matter um, would be something that, a, that a, part, a bacteria would be more likely to attach to as opposed to like a clay particle. Um, so like something that's weathering off of a rock. So it's potentially that bacteria would be more attached to that. Um, but I can't say for sure what things are more attached to in the Hudson River um, because I mostly just did it by size. Um, there are some people who are working on the actual chemical composition of the particles um, in the Hudson River, but it's really hard to isolate like the bacteria, the particles that the bacteria are on and then measure the concentration or the chemical composition of those particles. I have attempted to do some of that. Um, I was doing like a lot of microscopy last year, but then I ended up finding that a lot of the bacteria were like attached to like ant legs and stuff like that that were in the Hudson. <laughs> um, and so I, that's another like organic substrate that the bacteria were attached to. Uh, so hard to say exactly, but yeah, it was it was very strange, made for some really cool images, um, but did not answer my question when I had looked for it. Um, so this is actually, this is the end that I have of uh, prepared things. Um, so I'm happy to talk about um, anything else related to microbes, the Hudson, um, or um, any more questions that you have from this talk. And so I just wanted to acknowledge real quick my advisor who I've been working with for the past five years is Andrew Jewell. Um, my advisory committee, Simon Levin um, and Ajit Subramaniam. And then I've had a couple different undergraduate mentees that I wanted to shout out here, Natalia Figueredo and um, Ariana Medina. And there's my contact information up there again. Um, I have like a little YouTube channel that I put a little video out there because I try to make sure everything is relatively accessible um, for everyone. And then I wanna thank my funding sources. I'm funded by NASA and by Riverkeeper at the moment. So thank you all very much for your attention. Um, and yes, please feel free to ask me any questions or shoot me a message.